Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, wow. (laughs) Maybe I should just go home now and leave you all with that memory. I am Cordoy's grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi, everybody. I tell you, we've heard three absolutely wonderful speakers, and we've got two powerhouses yet to come. And I'm glad I decided a few years ago to join this fellowship. If I hadn't, I sure would be convinced after this weekend that this is the place I belong and want to be. Uh, I said I was grateful. We're not going to be here long enough this afternoon for me to tell you all the ways that I'm grateful. But Virginia said this morning that this is a program that works in good days and bad days, good times and bad times. When I was a young thing of 60, (laughs) somebody gave me a pillow with needlepoint that said, old age ain't for sissies. (laughs) I found out what that means as I advanced in years. The last two years have maybe been the worst of my life. But AA was right there in the bad times, just like it had been in the good times. Now, I have to warn you before I get going that I'm known as a weeper. So you shouldn't take it seriously if I cry. (laughs) Just let me go on and cry if that's what happens. I can never be sure. Everything that can happen happens to us in AA. Somebody said if you're not a piano player when you're drunk, you don't get to be a a piano player when you're sober. And, you know, good things and bad things happen to all of us. I lost my husband a number of years ago, and this was extremely difficult, but AA was there, and I found out then that God gives you what you have to have when you have to have it. It just happens. After a certain length of time in this program, when you get in the midst of a really tough situation, you just get on automatic pilot. It takes over, and the right things seem to happen. Two years ago this past summer, my daughter developed cancer, and she later died of it. Your children are not supposed to die before you do. This has been the most difficult thing that I've ever had to deal with. I talk about it because I want to share everything what's happening now as well as what happened years ago with everybody in AA. I want you to know it'll be all right. You don't get over these things, but you get through it. And you get through it by the grace of God, with the help of this program, with your friends in and out of AA, with the rest of your family. You just have to put one foot in front of the other and do what God puts before you that day. This time that my daughter and I spent together, she was became ill in June, July and died in January. This was really a grace-filled time for both of us. As difficult as it was, it was a time when we were knit and joined together in a very special bond, and I'm grateful for this. You know... Always, first of all, I'm grateful to be sober today. I'm grateful that all those years ago, almost 65 years ago, Bill and Dr. Bob met in Akron and began the process that's still going on all over the world of one alcoholic speaking to another, speaking in the language of the heart. I'm grateful for the absolutely wonderful opportunity that I had 
to work for 15 years as a member of the staff of our general service office in New York. I could spend the whole time this afternoon talking about GSO and what we do there and what happens. I know that's not why I was invited here. But I want to share just one story with you about it, and then I'll do what I was invited to do. A uh, number of years ago, when I was working in the office, I was asked to go over to Rutgers University to speak to the class of people over there, professional people, about AA. Not tell my story, but make an objective talk about AA. It's ridiculous to think that a member of AA can make an objective talk, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was asked to do. So after I made this talk, <clears throat> one of the professors came up to me, and he said, uh, I'd like you to come and talk to my class in the morning, and I want you to talk about the AA service structure. I said, you can't be serious. AA members don't want me to talk about the AA service structure. <laughs> he said, that's what I want you to do. And I thought, well, okay. I, <laughs> I'll hone up my skills. AA members don't give me a lot of opportunity. So I went and I talked to him, and I drew a picture of the pyramid on the blackboard, and I talked about the service structure, how it begins with the group, and how this is our communications network. If I need a sponsor for somebody in California, and I'm in New York, it's easy to do. <clears throat> At any rate, I went through the whole rigmarole, and when I sat down, the man said, <clears throat> Okay, I've asked the lady from AA to come here and explain their structure to you, hoping you could learn something. Now, you have a facility. You have a place for your office. You have your office furniture and your equipment. You have the people employed that you need. You have been educated. You have your skills. Now, all you have to do is to deliver your service to the person who needs it. He said, this is why I asked the lady from AA. They do the best job of anybody of delivering their service, which is the message that we carry. That's our service, of delivering our service to the alcoholic who still suffers. I thought this told me a lot about service. <clears throat> what it's about is delivering our message and having a network through which to do it. It's an absolutely wonderful little organization. When you think you're a bunch of people who at one time couldn't even sign their name. <laughs> <coughs> and somehow, this office that reaches out to millions of people all over the world has been in existence all these years and is still functioning. I loved my time there. You can tell that I did. Now, I was invited here to tell my story. This has never been an easy thing for me to do. But I welcome opportunities to do it. Because it is the story of the transforming experience of my life. Because during the years that I drank, I became the kind of woman that I never wanted to be. Destructive, irrational unpredictable. Thanks to the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have at least begun to be able to become, I hope, a new and different kind of person. And in all of this, I found the help that I needed from people like you in rooms like this all over this world. I never have been the kind of person who had a whole lot of confidence in my own ability to accomplish anything worthwhile. I found out after I came here, it matters very little whether I have confidence in myself or not, provided I have confidence in the power greater than myself that I call God, 
and in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, when I went to my first AA meeting in September 1957, and by the grace of God, I have not had a drink since then, I... I really had come to the end of my resources, and these had been considerable. I thought I was beat. I had used up everything. There was no place to turn. I thought there was no hope for me. I had 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 every kind of help that is available in a great city like New York, which is where I lived at the time, and I came here as a last resort. Now, at that time, it would have been impossible for me to believe that the time would ever come when I would be able to look back on the terrible years that preceded my arrival here and accept the fact that, for me, they were probably the necessary preparation for what I've found since being here. I've learned so many things. And when I say I've learned something, I don't think that I ever learned anything for once and for all. I still have to remind myself many times of the things that I've learned. I have to remind myself that I'm powerless over alcohol, that I'm powerless over a lot of other things, but that there is help. There is an answer to this powerlessness if I can simply accept it. I had to learn that I had the right to be wrong, that I had the right to make mistakes, that I had the right to make poor choices, that I even had the right to fail in things that mattered a lot to me, provided I still continued my commitment to this program and to the power greater than myself that I call God, who has seen me through so much this far along the way. I began to drink with anything that you might call regularity, sort of late in life for an alcoholic. I was 26 years old, married, the mother of two little girls, when my husband went overseas during World War II. And I was left alone with these children. And I moved back to Sewanee, Tennessee, where my mother had a place. And I decided to sit out the war there and wait for my husband's return from overseas. And there were a lot of other women there in the same boat that I was in. Their husbands were overseas and they had children. And we used to get together in the afternoon, turn the children loose in the yard with the sand pile and the swings and the sliding board, and we'd sit on the porch and rock and share our experience, strength, and hope with each other over a few drinks. <laughs> and I thought this was wonderful. I thought, Christ, where has this divine custom been all my life? <laughs> Why am I just now finding out about this? Well, I began to look forward to that time of day. I became a clock watcher. And I began to associate all experiences of fun and relaxation and good times with those times when I drank. Now, I'm sure the other women that I drank with did not react in the same way that I did. I have a feeling that even if I had known I was reacting differently, it wouldn't have made any difference to me then, as long as I was able to handle it well in fairly large amounts, and it turned out that I had a famous hollow leg, like many of us do. God knows I was going to need it as time went on. (laughs) I found it enormously flattering when we were going on a trip or a picnic, going to do a little drinking. They would all say, well, let Coral Louise drive. She never gets tight. Uh, And it's wonderful. You know, this was a big accomplishment. (laughs) When my husband came home from overseas, I thought this was the answer to all my problems, and there had been a lot of them, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, I had 
unrealistic expectations. I always had unrealistic expectations. I'm inclined to have unrealistic expectations to this day. <laughs> I find that <laughs> many of my character defects have simply modified. They have not <laughs> vanished. <laughs> but I thought when he came home, everything was, this would solve everything. Well, he noticed that I had become a daily drinker. He didn't complain about it. Uh, he just noticed it, commented became a daily drinker himself. Uh, but things weren't the same. He had been overseas with the 5th Marine Division. I had been at home with two little girls. And our experiences were different. And we were having problems. When he'd been home for a few months, we decided to go to New York for a year where he would do an advanced degree and this would give us a little breathing spell, and I thought this was wonderful. I love New York. It was a geographic tour. Of course, I took myself with me. But uh, I loved everything you do in New York, and I thought this was going to be wonderful. We hadn't been there before too long, before I developed a very peculiar symptom. I still had never been drunk in my life at this point. I shook all the time. I couldn't sign my name. I couldn't pour a cup of coffee. It was just terrible. So finally they took me to a series of doctors, and I went through a battery of tests, and it was decided that I should have psychotherapy. And this burned me up. We had problems, but I had to go to see the shrink. <laughs> now this is... I'm talking about 1947. Not every other person I knew in 1947 was having psychotherapy. <laughs> the only people that I knew who were having psychotherapy were crazy. And I didn't think I was crazy. However, I did want to save this marriage. I wanted to be a good mother to my children. And so, gritting my teeth, I agreed to go. And after 18 months of what the therapist considered extremely successful treatment, and I went three and four times a week, I went to a party one night. And I still think I drank in the usual manner and in the usual amounts, only this time something very peculiar happened. I got terribly drunk, and I had a blackout. And I was completely unprepared for either one of those things. I didn't even know what a blackout was at that time. I had fallen down a flight of stairs the night before, and I thought I had a concussion. And that's why I couldn't remember anything. I was too ashamed of the cause of the fall to go to a doctor. But I did discuss it with the therapist. And he said all the things I wanted to hear. He told me that I shouldn't worry about it, that this was the kind of thing that could happen to anyone occasionally, that in my case, he even thought it was a good thing, that it meant we were finally breaking through some of this armor. He did suggest, however, that until we uh, resolved some difficult problems that we were dealing with, that maybe I should be careful about any drinking that I did, and I agreed with him. I certainly didn't want anything like that to happen again. And I set out to be careful. And I tried every way that I could think of to be careful. <laughs> and every way that anybody could suggest to me to be careful. The problem was, I didn't know it. My doctor didn't know it. My family didn't know it. My friends didn't know it. I had already lost the ability to be careful. I had already crossed whatever that invisible line is that separates those people who can drink successfully from those who can't. I had reached the point of no return. This would have been impossible for me to accept at that point. I just didn't believe it. I honestly did believe that if I could continue in the therapy, 
and unlock this trap, which contained what my friends referred to as the real me. If I could release this person, that everything would be all right again. That I would be able to put some order into my life. And that in that order, drinking would fall into its proper place. And so I set out on this pursuit of the will of the wisp known as the real me. And I endowed this search with every ounce of energy and imagination and resource that I had. I continued to look for it in psychotherapy. I went three and four times a week for nine years. It is not surprising that the therapist was unable to help me with the problem, which I categorically refused to discuss. I meant to discuss it. <laughs> I would plan to discuss it. I would write down what I was going to tell him. I'd be on my way to his office, and I'd get in such panic that I wouldn't be able to say a word. I'd have to make up a story to account for the condition I was in. I never showed up drunk, but I showed up so hungover I could hardly see. And I mean, after all, he'd gotten his degree. He must have known what was wrong. <laughs> but he never mentioned it. <laughs> I searched for my answers in worthy causes. I kept thinking if I could find something that was bigger than I was, that I could really care about. If I could just give myself to it, then maybe I wouldn't drink so much. But I didn't find anything that big. I looked for it in books in the study. I was always running off to Columbia or NYU or the new school to take the course, thinking if I could learn how the people had lived and gained wisdom, that maybe I could apply it to my own life. But I never found any cases like mine. I looked for it in domesticity and home life. My house has never been so clean. I couldn't clean up anything on the inside, so everything on the outside had to be just so. I've never given so many parties. Sometimes people would show up for a party that I'd invited them to, and I wouldn't remember having made the call, but somehow we'd get through it. <laughs> I saw it for my answers at Epic Field. In the days when the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn, I was a great baseball fan. And I'd, in the summertime, our children went away. And what few controls I permitted in my life were gone. And the drinking always got very much worse. And I thought, if I have to get to Ebbets Field 77 times every summer, and get home from Ebbets Field 77 times every summer, I won't drink so much. So I got all my family to go in together, and for my Christmas present, they all gave me a season ticket to all the Dodger home games. And 77 times every summer, I got to Ebbets Field, and by the grace of God, I got home. <laughs> <laughs> because at Ebbets Field, I discovered beer. <laughs> and the beer vendors discovered me. <laughs> and they would come around at the end of the seventh inning after the stretch and put down three or four cans of beer and say, Well, lady, I hope for your sake the game doesn't go into extra innings. Because <laughs> we're, not, we're not coming back. I sought for my answers in my religion, which I had turned my back on a number of years before, but I had it all wrong. I was busy trying to make sure the higher power understood what my will for me was. I had to come here to find out that it works the other way around. I cannot describe to you the chaos and confusion that were created in my life and in the lives of all those people who were close to me 
by this attempt of mine to live two lives at the same time. Because all the time that I was looking in all these other places for answers, of course, I was also looking in the content of the tenth of a bottle. And here I really always did find the key. But the door that this key unlocked was not the one that I was looking for. Because it was the door to a Pandora's box. And out of it came this destructive, irrational, unpredictable woman that scared everybody to death, including herself. I believe that what came out of that bottle was the real me and that everything else was a shame. And this is what created all this confusion. My children got constant mixed messages. They weren't neglected in any conventional sense. They were fed and they were dressed and they were taken to the doctor and all those things. But the mixed messages that they got were just terrible. This attempt that I made to live somewhat constructive life on the one hand and the other in the shadows, on the dark side. This finally just brought me to the point of despair where nothing seemed worth the effort anymore. The gap was too wide. The gap between this woman who made some attempts at worthwhile living and this creature who was so beset by obsessive and compulsive drinking that she poisoned and kicked over every good thing that she did, this finally brought me to the point of despair where nothing seemed worth the effort. And it was in this defeated and burnt out frame of mind that I showed up at my first AA meeting. I didn't find the key that opened the door right away. But I found the key that opened the first door and a lot of doors since then when I was able to accept the fact that I was an alcoholic. When I was able to accept the fact that there was nothing that I or anyone could do to change that. But I could change the meaning of it and take the destruction out of it by becoming a sober alcoholic one day at a time. And a whole new world opened up before me. In everything that I did, I found the incentive from the example of people like you. I found the tool from your experience. And I found the courage from your unfailing strength and support to begin to face the realities of my own life one day at a time. I am grateful for this beyond my ability to express. I have no words. I will never have the words. And so I have had to find ways to express my gratitude, at least partially, by love and service to this fellowship and to the people in it who are the ones that showed me the difference between despair and hope, between futility and a kind of fulfillment, between slavery and freedom, really. Now, I have to tell you about my last drunk. They say, if you can't remember your last drunk, maybe you haven't had it. I hope I've had mine. I remember it. This was the weekend before Labor Day, 1957. I was expecting company for the weekend. At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I was in my kitchen stirring around, getting ready for people. When I came here and they told me about postponing the first drink, I understood that. I had been postponing for years. So I postponed the first drink as long as I possibly could that day. And about four o'clock, I took the first one. And almost with the first sip, I was just sort of overwhelmed with this sickening shock of recognition of the hopelessness and helplessness and near despair of my situation. 
I hated what alcohol did to me. I had hated it for years, and I was so sick and tired of it. And then without a plan in my head or a thought, I got up and I went to the telephone. And I called my husband. And for the first time in my life, I said something appropriate about my drinking. I said, please try not to be angry with me when you come home. I know I'll be drunk when you get here. But I hope it may be the last time. And then out of the blue came the words that saved my life. I hadn't even thought of it. I just said, if you'll call AA and find out where their meetings are, I'm willing to try it. I don't even know whether I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) I know if I am, it's not my fault. But it will be my fault if I don't try to find out and do something about it. He was so stunned he couldn't say a word. He said, yeah, okay, fine, I'll make the call. Well, <laughs> there wasn't any meeting that night because, after all, I had told him I was going to be drunk by the time he got home, and I owed it to myself, did I not? <laughs> <laughs> the week before that, I had called up the children's pediatrician and his wife, who were neighbors and good friends, and asked them to come over for the evening. And I was being a good hostess and serving drinks. And I'd serve one and take two, you know. I wasn't drunk, but I wasn't really sober. And I was talking to the doctor about a problem I was having with one of the kids. And he said to me, now just stop, I have something I have to say to you. And I should have said it a long time ago. You're not going to solve this problem or any other one you have unless you do something about your drinking. It's out of control, and I want you to let me call Ruth Fox. She was a well-known specialist in New York, and I want you to go to see her. Well, I was just as mad as he thought I might be, (laughs) only I was mad at my husband. I thought my husband had ratted on me. (laughs) This doctor had been with me innumerable times when I couldn't even stand up. And I thought my husband had to rat on me. At any rate, I said, uh, no, thank you. <clears throat> We're not going to spend any more money on me and my problem. I'll have to find another way. And then I said about getting rid of him as fast as I could because I wanted to tear into my poor husband, <clears throat> which I did. And the next week may be the worst week that my husband and I ever spent. <laughs> He thought I might be dangerous to myself. He knew I was dangerous to him. (laughs) He considered putting me in the hospital, only there was no way to get me there without tying me down. And it was at the end of this week that I made this telephone call to him. Well, after I hung up with him, the phone rang. And guess who it was? It was this doctor, the children's pediatrician. He said, uh, I want to know if you've been thinking about the conversation we had last week and if you've made a decision about what you're going to do. And I said, just a minute, please. I said, this is uncanny that you should call right now. (laughs) And I told him what had happened. I said, I just spoke to Lee. And I told him I'd be willing to go to AA. He said... You said you'd be willing to go to AA? I said, yes. Don't you think it's a good idea? He said, it's the best thing you could do. But I wouldn't have dared suggest it. Why won't they dare suggest it? I don't understand this. He said, I said, you think it'd be too infantile of me if I asked Lee to go with him, scared to go alone? He said, if he won't go, let me know. I'll go. Just go. (laughs) So I hung up, and I'm telling you, I felt like I had bit the bullet. I was standing in the dead center of the universe. I always say I got to AA by the grace of God and telephone knowledge. 
I had a little drink and had another little drink. And with the fourth drink, the telephone and I became, we went steady. <laughs> we had a real affinity for each other. I would write notes to myself and say, do not use this phone. <laughs> and when I'd had three or four drinks, <laughs> say, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of, and I'd start twirling. <laughs> so I got on the phone, and I called up everybody I knew, <laughs> local and long distance, <laughs> to tell them my big news. <laughs> not, not one person said, you don't need that. Not one. <laughs> The next day when I came to, I never woke up, I came to, as from under an anesthetic. The phone started ringing, and it was some of these people that I had called the night before. They knew I had a way of making phone calls and not always remembering that I had made it, so they wanted to remind me. <laughs> I said, gee. By this time, I was having second thoughts. I thought maybe, maybe I had spoken too soon. Maybe you know, it's kind of rash of me to say that to Lee. <laughs> anyhow, they reminded me. Well, I couldn't go to the meeting that night or for several nights because I had all this company coming from out of town, and I had laid in heavy supplies, <laughs> and I had expected to have a big weekend. I knew enough about AA to know that you did not teach people how to drink, that the idea was that you stop. So I sat the whole evening, whole weekend, looking pathetic, deprived, noble, drinking water and Coca-Cola. The Tuesday after Labor Day, as my sister left, she said, you have got to find a better way than this because none of us can stand you this way. <clears throat> so she left, and my moment had come. I had to go to the meeting. I spent all day throwing up. <laughs> that night was a Tuesday night. We walked out of the door. I stood on the steps. Boy, you have really done it now. You have lost your way. You're about to take a leap into the darkness. Little did I know that this leap would turn out to be my leap of faith and that this darkness would turn out to be better than any light that I had ever known. I didn't know any of this at the time. I thought this was the end of everything, that I would just have to find a way to endure. I thought it was the end. It turned out to be the beginning. And things are very dark for me now. I remember that day, how I thought it was the end, and it turned out to be the beginning. This is important to me. I went to that meeting, terrified, Sick with shame, shaking. We got in a taxi. We went to the old Manhattan group, which was in a section of town which had not yet experienced urban renewal. <laughs> it was sort of run down. I said to my husband, what would my grandmother say? She could see me now. He was kind enough not to say what would she think about what got you here? We got out of the cab. I said, if I ever needed a drink in my life, I need a drink now. He said, let's just go to the meeting. If you have to have a drink, when we come out, we'll get one now. So this was a beginner's meeting. And at the intergroup office, they had told him to ask for a man named Charlie. A man named Charlie was leading the beginner's meeting. He was from Knoxville, Tennessee. He looked like my brother, who was an alcoholic, and he sounded like my father, who was an alcoholic. And his wife was this lovely woman from Dallas who was sitting next to me. 
And he began to say all those things <clears throat> that I still don't hear any place else except in AA. Those home truths. You know, I had all kinds of good people trying to help me. And it wasn't that they didn't care. And it wasn't that they didn't know anything. They probably gave me good advice. They just didn't give me the right advice. But here was somebody who had the right advice. He finally said the words that turned the screws in my head. He said, you can't be a little bit alcoholic anymore and you can be a little bit pregnant. It's just a question of how far the condition has progressed. And I understood it. See, I had always looked at my father's case and my brother's case because I wasn't like them. I thought maybe I wasn't alcoholic. Just that I had a different pattern. And I could have gotten there. Believe me, I could have gotten there. And he said all those other things about what we used to call nickel therapy. I guess we have to call it four-bit therapy now. A telephone call, coffee, cup of coffee, Hershey bars. I hadn't eaten Hershey bars since I was 10 years old. I bought them by the case after that. <laughs> <clears throat> I had one in every pocket, in every drawer in the house. It was a Hershey bar. We had to put in an extra telephone line because I was on the phone all the time. And I began to drink eight and nine cups of coffee a day. <laughs> Nothing compulsive about me, you will say that. <laughs> After the beginner's meeting, we went to the open meeting, and they had three male speakers, all of whom had a Bowery-type background. Well, the wife of the man who was leading, had led the beginner's meeting, was sitting there standing myself, and she's saying, oh, I do hope you'll go to a meeting tomorrow night. She said, most of them are not this rough, and we usually have a woman speaker. I smiled at her. My husband said, you never did anything like this. Maybe I shouldn't have brought you here. Do you want to go home? I said, why don't you shut up and let me listen? <laughs> Let me listen to what they're saying. <laughs> he was stunned. Not because I had been rude. He was used to that. But because I wanted to hear what these guys said. It never once occurred to me to think that I didn't belong there. What I thought was, if they can have been so sick and had so little to get well for, if they could do it, maybe I could do it too. This was the grace of God that enabled me to suspend criticism and analysis and judgment and instead to listen and consequently to learn a little bit. And that's what AA has done for me ever since. It became a kind of school for me. And after a lifetime of exposure in academic circles, it's here in this program that I began the things that I always wanted to know, for which I can never give you adequate thanks. Now, I'm almost through. <laughs> Whenever I have spoken, I tell one story. I failed to do it once. I had been invited to speak at an anniversary in New York in the Evening was getting late, and we had a saying in New York that no souls were saved after 10 o'clock. And it was getting to be 10 o'clock, so I decided I'd better just finish and sit down. And this guy came up and grabbed me by the throat afterwards. <laughs> he said, you didn't tell about the dinner party, and that's the only reason I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell about the dinner party. <laughs> It's not the worst thing I ever did, but it describes in a capsule what my life was like, what might have been expected of me in that life, and what I did with it as a result of alcoholic drinking. My husband was an Episcopal clergyman. He was the chairman of the Department of Religion at New York University. And a couple of years before I came into AA, he asked me if we could have a dinner. 
for the faculty and staff from his department at NYU, and I gladly consented to do this. And I worked hard to make this party a success. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was all through my chores. I thought I'd take a little rest before I got dressed. And then I had one of those inspirations <laughs> that occur with some frequency to alcoholics. I thought, uh, I believe I'll have a little glass of sherry to help me become drowsy. I knew a little glass of sherry didn't make me drowsy. Took a little bottle of sherry to make me drowsy. And I was one of the alcoholics that knew long before AA that it was the first drink that got me into all the trouble. But I didn't know how to stay away from the first drink. I thought I could apply reason. I had been applying reason for all these years with no success, but I tried it one more time. <coughs> I said to myself, any fool would know enough to be discreet at a time like this. And I took the first drink. And you know what happened? I didn't have the luck to pass out. I never passed out. I didn't have sense enough to leave home. I never did do that either. I showed up. <laughs> I showed up almost falling down drunk. Near hysterics, which I always was when I'm drunk. Muttering what I hoped, I hope still was a stream of un gibberish that was not understandable to anybody. I say this with feeling because what I had to say was highly uncomplimentary to my husband and it was not expressed in the language that most people associate with a clergyman's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the people at this party were strangers to me. We were Episcopalians. Episcopalians take a sort of relaxed attitude towards social drinking. Not that they considered my drinking social. <laughs> but these were people from the Midwest, most of them from what I would call a temperance-type background. They didn't even smoke. And in those days, everybody smoked. These were the kind of people that I call squares. And I called them that <laughs> at the top of my lungs all evening long. <laughs> you talk about arrogance. Here I was, the boss's wife, clergyman's wife, the hostess drunk and disorderly, and I had the nerve to refer to them in what I intended to be uncomplimentary terms. The day after this party, my remorse was something spectacular. I simply wanted to crawl into a hole with the rest of the rats and stay there. I never wanted to come out again. I wasn't even able to tell my husband that I was sorry. I thought he ought to know I was sorry. That no one would behave this way if she could help herself. I don't know if he knew that or not. He did know, I'm sure, after that party, that I no longer drank because I had unresolved personality problems. <laughs> I drank now because drinking had become my number one problem. Now, you might imagine that in my life and circumstances that a performance like I've described would create a bottom. Well, I didn't come to any such conclusion. I wasn't ready to stop drinking. I did decide that something had to be done about the drinking. And I don't recommend my system to anyone who's new, who hasn't tried it. I did it with indifferent success, but probably more than I deserved. I decided that I wouldn't do any drinking at all when other people were around. And before long, I, who had been and am now a gregarious kind of person, no longer wanted to be around people. I didn't even care whether my husband sat and talked to me in the evenings after the children went to bed. 
I didn't want to plan to do things over the weekends and in the evenings with the kids. I just wanted them all to get the hell out. Leave me alone to drink in peace. Of course, there wasn't any peace. Because there isn't any peace in solidarity and fun. And that's what booze was doing to me. I was a lost soul. In chains. My chains may have been made of the crepe paper variety. But in my opinion, these were the most difficult ones to break. Thanks to AA. I no longer feel like a lost soul, and I am no longer in chains. I'm no longer a prisoner. I have a choice. I can take one drink with all its consequences, or I can do it the AA way and stay away from one drink for one day. I used to think I had to have goals. I learned a long time ago that I don't have to have goals. I just have to have a way. A way. My way is the way of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. This will take me where I need to go, hand in hand with all of you and with the power greater than myself that I call God. I fall into the old ways of thinking easily. A number of years ago, I can remember being in one of these snits And I was kicking the furniture and slamming the doors and pushing the drawers and muttering curses under my breath, saying, you know, you sold yourself a bill of goods. What's so different about your life anyway except that you're sober? Except that I'm sober. When I came here, the only thing in the world I was looking for or even hoped to find was sobriety. And if I want to know what it would be like to lose it, All I have to do is to remember those last two years when I drank alone late at night, walking up and down the stairs in my house, always going for that one last drink. And I remember how I used to think even then, surely there must be some purpose in this. I must be looking for something that's missing from my life. And even in my drunken confusion, I was right about that. I was looking for something, and thanks be to God, I found it. I was looking for AA. I was looking for all of you. I was looking for the power greater than myself. I'm not proud of these things I've told you. None of us is proud. I spent years trying to forget them and others like them. I know now that I must not ever forget lest I forget to be grateful to God for helping me to find AA. Lest I forget to be grateful to AA for helping me to find my life. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.